Namaskar and welcome everyone. I am Ravi Gupta. I am an editor in chief of a magazine called Digital Learning. We are uh, India and Asia's first and the only magazine focusing on ICT in education for last 15 years. And uh, we are here uh, with a, a very interesting uh, panel discussion here. And the uh, discussion topic is building a cadre of online first faculty. And uh, today is the era of online uh, in the uh, COVID situation. And uh, this uh, topic is highly uh, relevant in these uh, troubled times uh, where the whole education scenario is getting reinvented. And uh, we have with us a, a panel of eminent speakers. And uh, first and uh, foremost, uh, we have the honor of having Dr. Pramath Raj Sinha. He is the founder and chairman of Harappa Education. Welcome, sir. Thanks for joining us. And he is also the man uh, behind the Indian School of Business. And uh, he was the uh, founding dean of ISB. And he's also the founder of Ashoka University, the two names which are, uh, are highly respected in the field of higher education in the country. And he has also uh, started this uh, new venture, which is the Harappa Education. And we are all eager to uh, listen to him about uh, this uh, new idea and this uh, new uh, wave is uh, uh, Singhji, he is the co-founder and director of Praxis Business School and it is uh, one of the foremost uh, business schools uh, highlighting uh, various uh, innovative uh, courses are its uh, forte and uh, we will be uh, glad to uh, listen to uh, Charan Preet uh, today uh, and uh, what are the new I mean, new H uh, school is uh, looking at. Welcome Charan Preet ji. Thanks for joining. Thank Thanks very much. Yeah. Namaskar. And uh, we have with us Dr. Indu Rao. She is the Director of Academics, Vellore Institute of Technology, BIT Vellore. Thanks uh, Dr. Indu ji for joining us and uh, we are all aware that VIT is at the forefront of higher education in the country and uh, uh, people uh, take the name of VIT with uh, very high respect and the VIT has created a, a global uh, benchmark sitting uh, in India and uh, uh, thanks for joining uh, Dr. Indu. Welcome. And uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Varendra Kumar who is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Chitkara University. Again, uh, Chitkara University is uh, one of the most uh, renowned and uh, respected names in uh, higher education in the country. And it's an honor to have Dr. Varendraji with us. So uh, starting this uh, panel uh, and going uh, straight away to Dr. Uh, Pramit Sinha and asking him that uh, in this uh, era of uh, COVID, uh, there are uh, large scale uh, changes happening in the higher education sector and the overall uh, ecosystem of higher education is getting impacted and new uh, paradigms of uh, on faculty development, uh, faculty uh, uh, training and uh, faculty and student engagement are uh, emerging. So uh, given uh, idea about how do you see this uh, situation and what is the road ahead? Uh, Ramaji. Starting with you. You started me with the most difficult question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'll touch on a few points that uh, uh, I would like to make. I'm sure that others have uh, also many points on this. Uh, I do think that this is a difficult year for our students, most of all. Uh, you know, we are all very excited that we are able to adapt to online, that our universities and institutions have made the transition. And of course, that has to be celebrated. Uh, it, the, the, the institutions and the teachers were also faculty were also caught off guard. But I do care about the fact that the students are getting disrupted quite badly because uh, two or three things for all the effort that we are making. Uh, there's a lot of overload of being on video. Uh, I'm finding that this medium uh, doesn't lend itself to the classroom schedule. Uh, it's another matter that you can watch videos or listen to webinars when you want. Uh, but when throughout the week you are on a television 
vision screen and that is the only way to learn with no other interactions it is putting a lot of load on our students uh, our students are also not in the best of uh, situations uh, we are finding uh, even in a place like isb which is catering to uh, fairly older students with work experience and so on these are people who have who are in places who are stuck in places where uh, their bandwidth is not great uh, of course we do hear of situations where people don't have devices at ashoka this year we actually had to send laptops to our uh, to our uh, scholarship students because they really come from backgrounds where they don't actually have a device uh, and also people are at home uh, and and you know homes can be cramped there are other people also at home parents are working there are other brothers sisters who are also studying so uh, i do think that we all must spare a thought that uh, this is a very tough time for our students and they are also doing a great job of trying to keep up and with the prolonged closure of the institutions are getting a little bit frustrated uh, so in a lot of the institutions i'm involved in at least we are allowing some people to come back to the hostel so that at least they can study from there uh, rather than having to deal with the challenges of studying from home and being online so i i i think that's one thing that is happening i think for the teachers uh, it's a huge challenge uh, while some teachers were comfortable with online most teachers were not have never had to deal with uh, uh, online uh, Uh, forget about teachers we are still struggling with muting and unmuting ourselves <laughs> and and uh, and and making sure that this uh, works i'm always scared that the electricity will go and the bandwidth will drop and what will happen on the webinar uh, so i think we are all coming to terms with this and it's a very disruptive time the good news is that i fundamentally believe that online education is here to stay and particularly in our country it's actually needed it's needed to bridge the gap uh, in education it's needed to bring the quality up uh, i feel so what has happened is that because of this forced situation because we have no choice uh, we have all had to adopt online and the positives of online are also coming uh, uh, to 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 the front and all of us are acknowledging that we can teach this way or that we can actually do some things in fact better this way uh, and i think that is where the long term implications of this are going to be quite uh, uh, i think quite profound uh, now let me come quickly to that uh, if you look at long term uh, in our country the big problem is that uh, we are providing either no education or very poor quality education which is almost like no education to most people uh, i mean our institutions are well intentioned we are making all the efforts but if you really look at the 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 majority of universities and colleges and this is not new news we all know this people are not getting a good education at all uh, and in fact most people are now going to struggle to get an education because as the numbers increase we are not going to be able to create the infrastructure to get quality education to people there i think the comfort with online uh, and the fact of what online can deliver where you don't need brick and mortar classrooms you, you don't need the typical teacher student ratio of 1 is to 20 or 1 is to 40 or uh, teaching loads of you know you can only teach so many uh, the the online education completely breaks the constraints of teaching load and teacher student ratio and physical classrooms so all of us can reach out to many more students uh, and uh, new people can also reach out to students which they have not been able to reach out and i think that's the exciting opportunity i think the student of the future is going to have a choice if they can go to uh, one of our universities Uh, or institutions then of course well and good but if they are not able to at least they can still get a good education outside and the last thing i will say is that you know there's this big debate about is online effective not effective uh, and this big debate about what i referred to earlier as the digital divide that this creates and i think those are those are armchair debates to have in the context of our country uh, because the truth is many many people in this country need online Uh, forget the people who are already going to ashoka or praxis or vit or chitkara but what about all the other people i think we need online for them and finally digital divide ke bare mein everybody talks about but my contention is that there is a classroom divide there is a 
campus divide right now right now people are not getting education and in 75 years we've not been able to take the classroom to them at least we will get bandwidth and device to them slowly that there's a better chance of doing that than building classrooms and getting teachers for them so i'll stop here but i think that the future overall looks very exciting uh, but for now i'm a bit concerned that this year is going to be very difficult for our students and our institutions sure uh, excellent uh, point uh, uh, points you have mentioned dr pramod uh, thanks for highlighting the uh, digital divide uh, situation uh, which is impacting but you also mentioned that digital is important because uh, many people don't even have any access so uh, like better to have uh, digital education rather than not having any education at all uh, let me uh, reach out to uh, charan preet uh, ji and ask him that uh, what's your uh, view on the emerging uh, impact of digital in the higher education sector yeah th thanks so i'm the i'm the one person who runs a small institute so i'll bring that uh, you know perspective as well because you know everybody else here is you know associated with very large institutions and they have their own problems but they also have scale and they have resources and you know it's 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 uh, it's, it's different so i think that uh, what we have seen is as pramod said you know we we transitioned as he said every college did we transitioned from a full in class and that was our usp that even in emerging technology delivery we were in class and full time so this is not a very scalable model but it's a is an immersive model so you know everybody everybody finds every institution finds its niches and we had found that and then that's the promise we made so i'm coming to you know the student side as well as the institution side so that's the promise we made and that's the promise that we could not deliver you know in some sense this time because in 3 months time our january batch went into we had to transition totally to online the other part was that you know but but again you know because we teach we we kind of work at the confluence of technology and management right so we we uh, most of our courses are there so so the kind of faculty we have luckily are very tech friendly and that issue was not there the faculty kind of everybody was very comfortable uh, you know going there but for the students it was a challenge and uh, you know uh, if, if you look at uh, so so right now the thing is that since we have experienced online over a period of time and since it's been an it's been a forced experience everybody is des desperate to get back into class both from the student perspective and and from the teacher perspective right however what we have learned here is that you know even tough concepts is there are some concepts which are pretty uh, deep and pretty abstract and which we were not sure that would we would be able to transmit in class we have been able to do that uh, on the flip side it has taken more time more effort from both student and faculty and both are getting more used to it okay and uh, what we have also learned is that small is more uh, or, or sorry less is more you know this completion of the entire topic and teaching everything you know is probably not on so your 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 what you teach kind of may have to reduce a little but you can if you have to go deep because the uh, you know ability to to understand and to conceptualize it it it, it does take a bit of a hit uh, if it is online and and i think that uh, teaching has also become more innovative uh, you know things like flipped classrooms and you know learning by doing and all of that which we were already talking about i think this pandemic has forced us to do all that uh, because we had to make the class more engaging and all of that so the way i look at it is that in higher education i think the brick and mortar is here to stay i mean the ashokas and the isbs and the you know vits and even the praxises will hopefully i mean practices hopefully the other surely uh, will, sh will will surely continue to be uh, institutes of eminence and there will be a very important campus experience that will happen there i think what may happen in higher education is see, there are i think different kinds of students different uh, you know different types there there could be time poor students or students who cannot afford these you know uh, amazing campuses i think that higher education will be able to address their needs because i think both from a student perspective and a faculty perspective we are more prepared now to handle that uh, i also feel that what pramod said that you know the digital divide so i think when we if we move 
for in, if if we continue to do online and this pandemic lasts i think the divide is going to increase in the short term because even people who are at campus don't have you know uh, bandwidth at home or you know they may not have the right uh, you know environment at home they may not even have enough space at home both from a you know physical as well as mental perspective yeah for them actually campus is actually a better place to go to to study for some i mean they are they, they can study anywhere so i think it's actually going to go down till we get devices and bandwidth to more and more people in the country i think i think i hope the requirement for education and health drives that in a big way and and i agree with pramod that that's easier to do than to have good teachers across india across campuses across schools and colleges across villages in india i think this is probably easier but it still has to be done yeah so uh, so i think the and and for campuses like ours i think online will, be, will is is going to be here to stay and it will supplement what we can do in class in a big way because this time we got the kind of speakers we've never got for our you know orientation because everybody was at home so we just got everybody on i mean we we got people from across the globe to talk to our students which is impossible to have and we never tried that also although the online medium was always available because we were we never we were never pushed to deliver more so you know this whole uh, place has actually pushed us to do more we have discovered stuff and it is the same for all institutes and i think we are going to use that the benefits of this to supplement and improve the quality of what we teach in class Uh, i think so for for so so campuses are going to gain in any case and i think off campus education is going to grow in a big way sure so uh thanks for highlighting this uh, point about uh, still the relevance of the campus education but uh, there's another whole sector uh, which is emerging uh, which is about uh, off campus education mm -hmm. let me uh, reach out to dr varinder kumar from chitkara university so uh asking you about uh, how uh, you are seeing the impact of digital uh, on the higher education sector energy uh very good morning to the extreme panelist and uh, dr ravi gupta for giving me this opportunity to discuss the things with the eminent speaker uh, i personally feel uh, i am an engineer and uh, the type of education which we are getting from campus it is not only the education from the teacher but it is the education from the peers also so uh, i feel virtual classroom cannot replace the traditional classroom because it is by its very essence or nature is not completely real the teaching on internet uh, is virtual reality what it is not the reality so uh, we feel like uh, this type of situation is there in hundreds of years like after 100 years and let's hope that the same type of things repeat after 100 years so within one or two year we are again going to forget this because the best part of the human is the mind which is going to forget the things which has occurred or which has happened to him uh, very soon so i feel uh, we still have to go for the traditional one but this pandemic has taught us to blend our learning system matlab we were earlier focusing so much on classroom teaching we were so much focused upon the traditional type of examination pattern which this pandemic has told us that you have to think out of the box this traditional way of teaching cannot go for a long so uh, i feel the virtual reality is the campus or other the virtual reality is the online teaching but the actual reality is the campus teaching so uh, the student has to come to the campus and uh, we we may be uh, taking some precautions or we may be thinking some of devices or some mechanism to uh, do this blending as well as so initially we may be open with say 50% may not opt for coming to the campus so it is uh, the blend that some who is there in the class is getting a face to face teaching and those who are sitting at the home so we have to 
maybe change our mechanism in that way that same class is to be telecasted through internet so the people initially for 6 month for one year i feel like they should get the same type of education while sitting at their places so um, i feel this is a opportunity for all of us to introspect to think what we can do a little bit more than the traditional one and this is the need of the r also because when we compare ourselves with the with the, the european countries or the the foreign countries there um, in most of the countries uh, they feel like uh, attendance is not that much compulsory criteria so you are you are there uh, you can uh, do the work at the day time and then in the night you are there at your place you log in to the uh, lecture videos of the professors and keep on uh, be studying there so we have to think in those ways that this generation needs that type of mechanism yes for the traditional courses like engineering medicine where you have to have the practical experience and that practical experience cannot be taught while sitting at the home so student need to come also so i feel Uh, this is the need of the r and we have to change ourselves according to that so sure. uh, i think uh, dr brender has uh, rightly highlighted the scope of uh, blended learning in this uh, situation and also the importance of the campus education thank you for that uh, let me reach out to dr indu rao who is the director of mellor institute of technology pit uh, dr indu i think uh, your uh, organization has implemented a lot of digital initiatives in these times if you can uh, talk about the impact it had on the students and the faculty yeah thank you dr ravi thank you for inviting me and thank you for putting together together this uh, esteemed panel it's a wonderful panel congratulations sir and uh, i'm very honored to be a part of it i also listen to all the esteemed panelists and i take from uh, a few points that were shared by dr pramath raj he shared about the importance of online education and reaching out to those who never had access to any education so that is a very important part which online education has that uh, those who cannot go to institutions where you have the parents have to pay a lot of money i think uh, since internet is reaching out to people they can access it Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Charan Preet Singh mentioned about the faculty. So there are not many good faculty across the country. I have had a chance to be a part of public universities, private universities, institutions of excellence, National Institute of Technology, Indian Institute of Management, and Institution of Eminence. And I have been working. In fact, my first PhD thesis is on how to improve our operational efficiency of educational institutions, technical institutions, higher education in India. we i have a real problems of having good faculty good staff good leadership in different institutions and because of this online education those few good faculty can also reach out to anybody and can be accessible to anybody in the country whether it is remote village rural areas or in the uh, mid tier towns or in the big cities i uh, also agree with uh, dr varinder kumar kawar who says that campus is equally important and uh, we need to look at blended learning so online has many advantages but campus also has advantage i will talk about vit before that i will share a very quickly an example see i passed out uh, from nit jaipur in 1992 we had one annual exam at the end of the year but we had every year we have so many uh, of our alumni who went and joined bureaucracy they turned out to be great entrepreneurs they are into the leading power sector and different uh, uh, different institutions of the country and we also developed a very good bonding because we took part in sports and music and dance we organized events together and we were able to connect personally and that was happening because of the campus even today i am currently president of tamil nadu and puducherry chapter of our alumni association and that bonding that we share of those years it stays even today what has happened over the years from 92 i'm just my personal example i'm saying because i'm a part of technology and management institutions that one year, one exam at the end of the year has converted into semester system trimester system and within each trimester and semester we are having four times we have a whole cycle of exams 
So you have uh, the continuous assessment, you have the final assessment, you have assignments all over the time. Students, if you just look at the pre-COVID times, they were busy. See, I have I have my children studying in America. I have I have I have myself studied there. When we have so many CAT and uh, I mean uh, this continuous evaluation, term and evaluations, the number of classes which students attend there are very very less. They don't attend classes from morning to evening, and all the time they are running between the classes. They are running between submitting the assignments. At the time, uh, the one previous university I was working, the student said, if the university does not put a condition of attendance, we will not attend any class. Because you, the, you have to have so much mandatory attendance, and then only you'll be able to give the exam, then you will be able to get the degree. The parents also want a degree, finally, from their children. And the whole concept of knowledge and education and the learning and sharing that uh, institution is supposed to deliver was getting diminished. It was diluted to a large extent across the country. I think online has really, really helped. I see a lot of positives for the online education. Now, coming to the VIT, VIT experience, when the pandemic uh, started, like uh, in March, I think we were, we were just short of uh, the final exams for our uh, passing out batch of the last year. We have, and we have a scale that is, uh, fortunately, we have a scale that is uh, really one of the largest in the country. So 46,000 students, our faculty, when we train our faculty, faculty itself is 2,000. So the number of students that many institutions would have, that many number of faculty we have. So even the class, the training and development programs that we do, we have that scale of uh, operation. Uh, sharing with you the example of when we train our faculty, because our campuses have become so huge, they are flourishing campuses. And even faculty is equally busy, like the students are busy in taking exams, faculty is busy in checking those assignments and exams, so everybody is busy. If we do development programs, training programs, in order to walk to the training hall physically during uh, um, campus training was difficult. Now when we do the training program, online has helped us to an extent, one link is shared we have developed technology interfaces. I mean, our technology is very strong. And every single training program, morning, afternoon, is attended by hundreds of faculty because they can, they can take their classes and then they can switch on to the other link and then they can attend the training program. We can invite speakers, experts, resource persons from around the world. We did our faculty orientation program. We recruited around 150 new faculty this time, only between Vellore and Chennai campus. And we were able to conduct long, one month long faculty orientation programs with speakers from around the world. Our faculty also came from around the world and wherever they were, they were able to join. And talking about the quality, the quality depends on, see, of course, it has taken one or two months for us to become normal, to feel normal before a screen. Like I also feel much more normal before a screen now because we have six months of pandemic. But the moment you start becoming feeling normal before the screen, the quality on uh, through this uh, online teaching does not suffer. I mean, at least unless there is some real practical lab experience that you want to do, there is no front bencher, there is no back bencher. Everybody is talking to you right in front of the screen. You are talking directly to the student. Student is right, uh, talking directly to you. The resource person is talking directly to the participant. The participant is directly talking to the. There is no distraction. Also, I would say because you are not being disturbed by your peers. We are not saying that there were very good institutions, very good learning. I am not complaining, but there were also many ethical practices in the institution, many disturbances coming in, which we are all aware of. And many of those things are uh, uh, be have become less because of this online. Students, they are able to save on time and on energy. Same with faculty. Faculty were expected to do teaching, expected to do research and institutional duties. Because of commuting, because of the time and energy that was getting wasted in that, now it is not getting wasted. They have more time to study. They have more time to read. They have more time to connect with scholars around the world. They have more time to do research. I think there are, um, I will stop here. I will not continue to um, take all the time of your program. But according to me, and one important thing, that pollution, the 36 million population of USA, that many students we have, imagine that much of population is not on the roads. We are saving our environment. We are saving on our health. And in these conditions, when pandemic has come, when the health is so much at risk, I think it is it is a great, great boon of online teaching and online learning. And our institutions, are, all Indians, I think they are very, very tech savvy. They are very smart. Our younger generation is even smarter. And we have taken on to online. And I think online school bags are small children. That school bags, stuff and nothing. You are giving fresh food to children at home. Mothers can give. And they are, for me, like what my children are doing their classes at this time in different rooms at my house. And they can eat fresh food. I think there is there is so much of uh, and uh, there is a lot lot more positive than is being talked out in the 
media and in the news to online education, then uh, we think, and it is 100% going to stay. Of course, we will have to have a blend of both, but online has many, many positives, many more than we realize, and we'll realize in the days to come. Sure. Uh, Except our points, Rupla uh, Indu, for uh, uh, highlighting the various uh, benefits of online education. That's also very important. And let me uh, uh, speak to, uh, reach out to Dr. Pramit Sinha and ask him, uh, what's your uh, vision of uh, about uh, Harappa education itself? You have been the, uh, the pioneer in the, uh, what do you call, in the campus education. You have uh, owned it, uh, like, let the ISB, let the Ashoka University, which are uh, campus uh, education programs. So, uh, your uh, this uh, recent uh, move in the field of online education. So, what was the inspiration? What was the idea? And uh, how uh, do you see of uh, making an impact in this uh, uh, sector? So, if you can talk about it, because we all are very uh, curious that uh, uh, what's the larger the picture which you have in uh, mind, Dr. Pramath? Over to you. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, uh, thank you for giving me the chance to talk about this. I, I, I think what the vision is, is really taking forward from what I was saying, Ravi, is how do you reach out to as many, many people as possible uh, and give them high quality education, not just any quality or B quality or C quality. And uh, I think we are all on this, everyone who spoke is very conscious of that, that there is the need to reach out and there is a possibility to do it uh, in, in getting high quality education to the last student, even the last student. Now, if I look back on my life, you know, as you very kindly put it, I've been associated with setting up many institutions and it's now been almost 25 years since we first started. A lot of people don't know, I got involved in setting up a new university in Malaysia in in 1995 called Multimedia University. So that's where my journey started. Uh, if I look back and I add up all the students who have entered these universities, uh, and my universities have not been as large as uh, what uh, Dr. Rao and Dr. Kanwar are involved. Uh, with, you know, the, the maximum intake is at ISB, which is 1,000 students. But if you were to add all of the students and take the annual intake, across all projects that I've been involved in, it would not cross more than 4,000 students, maybe touch five students. And when I look back on 25 years of work, and I'm not trying to say that I'm very important and I should touch more people, but you look at that and you say, listen, all I've done is affected 5,000 students a year. Now, people, when I say this, people say, oh, you're being humble and this and that. No, I'm not. I'm just making a statement of fact that uh, in a country where there are so many people who need education. I'm only affect, able to affect 5,000. So for a long time, I've been thinking that I have to do something uh, to do uh, to educate people at a much larger scale, given the problems we have in our country. And so that was one big motivation of setting up Harappa. The other motivation was key. What should we teach? You know, if uh, you see, everybody is going to do online. Charanpreet is going to go and do his courses online. Dr. Kanwar is going to start doing online. Dr. Rao is going to start doing online. So I was thinking, let me do something that other people are not doing. And that has been always the hallmark of what I've done with ISB was a one year MBA in the private sector, trying to compete with people uh, who are going to IIMs or going abroad. Ashoka was purely liberal arts. Uh, so here I feel that if I look back on my life as an educator, as well as a corporate uh, person who has worked in business for many years, which is still the biggest employer, I feel that one of the things that is getting lost in education today is these, the, what people have called soft skills, but these are not really soft skills. Uh, it is even more relevant today when everybody is talking about 21st century skills and people are talking about 60 year working life and 60 year curriculum, lifelong learning uh, and so on. People are saying as the world becomes more uh, dependent on AI and robotics, what will be the role of humans? So all of these questions are leading to, if you will, a curriculum of the future 
that certainly include some very basic skills around critical thinking. How do you think? How do you form judgment? How do you problem solve? How do you communicate? How do you collaborate? How do you lead yourself and lead others? These are the kinds of things I'm trying to teach on the Harappa curriculum. Now, if you ask me, these things should be taught in our school systems also. If you look at the new education policy, uh, it talks about a holistic, multidisciplinary education. They use some of these words around critical thinking and so on. All I'm trying to do is correct for that gap in our education. Uh, and you see, traditional universities and institutions will find it tough to do this because traditional academics don't see the need for this. And they come from very, very straight disciplines that we created, you know, 40, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. PhD They have studied in that area. So they will teach only in that area. These areas don't have any departments. These areas don't have PhDs in them. So I'm trying to say that, listen, if I'm going to do something online, let me address a critical gap, which for want of a better definition is soft skills, but I call it cognitive behavior and social skills. This is the psychological definition of these skills. How to think, which is cognitive, how to problem solve, which is also cognitive, how to communicate, which is social, how to collaborate, which is more social and behavioral, and how to think about your own self, which is more uh, social and behavior. So that's what I'm teaching. And the last thing I will say, and I will shut up after that, I felt that, you know, I could have started another campus to teach this, right? Uh, I felt that to really crack the problem of online, and how to make online really effective. I have to start with nothing from the past. You know, I have to start as if I don't have classrooms. I don't have campus. I don't have students. I don't have faculty. Only thing I have is this computer, right? Now, if I lived in a world where none of the old things existed, then how would I teach? I feel a lot of what is happening online is taking the classroom education and bringing it online. But I think the much bigger opportunity is that we blank slate se shuru kare, that we, we have nothing and we start again. Usse we will get insights. Of course, it's hybrid. You will combine. Uh, and it's not that I'm saying throw out whatever we have learned over the so many years that we have been teaching through the classroom. But to bring true innovation, and I believe that true innovation in online education will come out of India. Because our needs are more. Our challenges are much greater. Uh, West, mein people are using online to supplement people who are already educated. Whoever is going online in the West is already educated. Our challenge in India is that people who will come online are not may not have had the education that uh, you would expect. That. So that's the third thing about Harappa. So really three things. One, to use technology to reach the last student. Two, to teach something that is really needed and nobody else is teaching. And three, to start online first so that we can really innovate and come up with the full, exploit the full power of online without being uh, being constrained by the legacy of the past. Uh, that's, the, that's what's behind Harappa. Thank you, Ravi. Excellent uh, points, uh, Dr. Uh, Pramath. Uh, I think uh, you are uh, looking at uh, doing something uh, very, very different, uh, which you have always done. Uh, uh, let me just ask a, a, a supplementary question here, that how do uh, colleges and universities uh, collaborate with an initiative uh, like yours? So colleges are yeah. So colleges are universities are using my content to teach students uh, uh, in a, a as part of their curriculum. Some are giving it for credit. Some are doing it for co-curricular. So uh, just as people are using courses from Coursera mm -hmm. to teach their students, people are using our courses to teach their students also. So universities administrators like uh, Dr. Kanwar or CP or Dr. Rao recognize this need. It's not like they don't see the need, uh, but because they, you know, most universities will have one communication skills course in the third year or fourth year before interview start. You know, that doesn't really teach students. So interview ke liye thoda sa unko confidence dene ke liye, but it doesn't really change the, so a lot of universities are recognizing this. 
uh, and I've kept the price really affordable so that, you know, it should not become a big thing. You know, you have to pay so much money. And, and that is the characteristic of online anyway. Most of the online mm -hmm. courses are very affordable. So that's how people are doing it. So interestingly, what has happened is that a lot of people are asking me to train their faculty first. I did not have this insight. Uh, when I first started talking to universities, a lot of the vice chancellors came to me and said, can you plus first teach our faculty? If our faculty adopt this, then they will feel uh, the need and also the enthusiasm to promote it with the students. So I have learned that uh, from uh, the university system. And so we are doing these faculty excellence programs. Uh, and what is now interesting is that what is happening is that universities are saying that, okay, please, earlier everybody said, Achha, career ke liye, placement ke liye, do it in the last year or, you know, last two, three semesters. Now, I think I've been able to convince people that please do it throughout, not just from in the end, but if you have somebody for four years, let me work on them and improve their communication skills on the full four years. If you have somebody for a two year MBA, let me work with them for the full two years. And by the way, this is not something that I'm doing for universities that I have not practiced on my own. At Ashoka, we do exactly this. For the entire time that the students are there, they are learning how to think, to read, to write, because this is really the foundation that has been lost in our school system. And, and employers still look for it. Uh, so how do you make sure that our graduates have this capability is what the universities recognize and I think they are using our courses to supplement what they are doing already. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, let me uh, reach out to uh, CP Singh and ask him that how do you see the, uh, like the uh, relevance of uh, courses like what uh, Nadapa is doing and uh, how do you uh, see in the context of you are like anyway running a business school uh, which is supposed to uh, teach uh, some of uh, these skills. Yeah. So yeah, in fact, I'm having a chat with some of uh, Harappa's uh, people as well. So yeah, so uh, interestingly, uh, things like critical thinking and, you know, collaboration, ability to collaborate, you know, uh, with diverse people and also with machines, uh, which, which we will be in, in, more, in deeper ways, uh, you know, uh, moving forward. Uh, and, and also communication and, and, and stuff like that, and also creative thinking, which I think is the most difficult to kind of manage here. Uh, yeah, so we uh, kind of, because we teach things like AI and data science and, you know, uh, and we've been doing it very, for, for a long time. So we keep abreast of what's happening around the digital transformation, because we are actually, our students are going and joining digital transformation uh, projects with, 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 with the corporate world, right? And, and so we are deeply engaged with that. So, you know, the three skills of, you know, communication, collaboration, and uh, critical thinking and all that, and all these things are, are, are now like recognized. And I think they were required even before, uh, uh, but now I think uh, the speed of change and the magnitude of change. So it's not just a hard skill place. I also struggle for a word, uh, Pramat, for soft skills because I think soft skills is too soft a word to describe what all it contains, right? So and it's a it's a highly abused word like strategy and paradigm. You know, we throw these <laughs> words when we when we are short of them, we say strategy, right? Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. So so yeah. So 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 then so what we we did as an institution, like uh, I mean, you know, somebody has to do the. So there there are people who deeply understand AI and data science, and I don't. So I have to also make myself useful, right? So I, I actually created content on this, you know, how do you tell a story? What is critical thinking? What does it involve? And if you even just look at critical thinking, the amount of stuff it involves, it's actually a, it's good enough for a course or even more than that. Because it eventually has to change your behavior because what you're trying to do is, you know, how do I evaluate what is right and what is not? And how do I how do I decide what to do and what not to do? That is critical thinking. And in, in a world full of fake news and full of uh, whatever is happening, I think it becomes a huge, the important skill, right? And since you are bombarded by so much media and so much everything, I think it's a very difficult skill to hold on to. I mean, you know, so it has to be you know it has to be part of you. So which is why I completely agree with Pramod. It's not something you teach in the final term. 
and surely if you have placements in mind i don't think even you should even look at what harappa does i mean i don't think i mean i would be very upset as a harappa person if my course is used for making the guy more placeable i mean i think it's a much more life skill uh, you know that that these guys are talking about so we do that we do that in the kind of you know we teach all of that because we are very small uh, we know our students personally we all want to scale up so tomorrow if we could even double the size i don't think we'll be able to do it ourselves uh, so and and we are looking at picking up one or two because again for us even you know small uh, you know uh, amounts are in this time uh, when when uh, you know everybody is you know revenue streams are a little lower than they used to be but i i think that it's 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 good to formalize and corporatize the whole thing which 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 pramod has done because i think it will be loosely be around somewhere some institutes would be doing their own thing but i think at a at a at a national level uh, to or maybe they can even go global i don't know what his plans are but at a national level to even make people aware that this is required so for for example and the other thing is these are transferable skills when we are talking about an uncertain future you don't know what your next job is going to be you don't have a linear you know career ladder Uh, that you know i start as a metallurgical engineer and i finish as a metallurgical engineer and all i do is the iron carbon diagram it's not going to happen like that right so if i have problem solving skills underlying which are my critical thinking skills and if i have project management skills which include collaboration then i can switch on the basis of my skills i can switch from discipline to discipline i can switch from job to job so these are the skills which which are tra- and, and today i think employers in india are still not putting it on the jd but i think slowly the jd will not be a jd it will be an sd you know it will be a skills description not a job description because that job may not remain as a job but i think as an employer today if i have running an industry i would look for these skills as if i have you have these skills i can get you to do anything i you know that is required so i think in from that sense i think extremely important luckily we are small and we are already doing it we'll be happy to you know increase that because our students need it there is no doubt about it sure uh, excellent uh, point uh, cp you uh, mentioned about uh, jd to sd which is a very interesting term i they like it and i think uh, i will be using it <laughs> a lot it seems so uh, let me uh, reach out to dr varinder and uh, ask him that how uh, do you see the importance of uh, soft skills and uh, things like the critical thinking and other uh, skills of which are not normally a part of the uh, uh, university uh, courses so uh, like how important uh, do you uh, 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 say it and how uh, like uh, what's your vision around uh, like imparting these skills to the uh, both the students and the, and the faculty itself dr varinder uh, sir the very good point raised by dr tina sir and dr charan uh, ki uh, this is something which you can't teach in the last semester so luckily in our university um, we have also uh, not that good number but we have more than 2000 student where i am there and in my other campus other state we have more than 20000 students so what we are doing sir in the beginning itself whenever any undergraduate student join us he has to undergo a test his proficiency test and based on the level of his proficiency in say, the main language which is english uh, he has been allocated the different uh, the soft skill modules so the target is at the end of 3 year or 4 year he should be if he is at level 3 he should reach at level 1 so that is the one part and second is if suppose there are somebody who has come from a convent educated or a very good school he need not to undergo the same type of uh, skill set again so he has been given an option of going for some foreign language he can means he should not be feeling like why he should attend that lecture he already knows everything so this is how what we are doing from the beginning itself when any of the student join us that is the first part second is regarding the the skill set or the critical thinking part 
we try to give emphasis on the paper setting part of any of the subject like during our time what we were doing differentiate between this and this write a short note on this so if that type of questions are there in your examination system then people will not understand or they will not uh, apply their mind for thinking so we we thought of as uh, dr indu told ki in now semester system we have one end of examination we have three uh, in between examination so those examination should not be like paper and pen or defining or say solving a question with the uh, the system or the ex system it is some questions where they have to apply their mind they have to think logically and then solve that question and no two answer can be same and the teacher has to evaluate it in that way that he should give the proper uh, justification proper grade or proper marks to the one who has thought out of the box he may not be very good in the end term uh, solution or the solution may be differ than the solution which is there in the book or that so now this is the second part of critical thinking third part which the sir said yes to have this type of change you have to train your faculty also because in most of the lack other than the education teacher the teacher who is teaching in the bed med or uh, the school teacher they are trained professionally how to teach in a class but the teacher who are there in the management institute who are there in the engineering who are there in the in the um, the medical side they are not trained technically to teach a student so we have to first train them that how you have to get yourself changed with the passage of time how you will be uh, taking all the students who cannot sit more than for more than 20 minutes in a class you can't force anything to them now because earlier we, it is only we who were asking the students who don't use internet or don't use mobile in the classroom or whenever they were there with the internet they are they were playing pubg or that type of games we were cursing them now this we are the same teacher who are asking them to open their mobile why are their data is getting exhausted so see this this dilemma is their student has to know has to be told that yes the same internet is there the same mobile same laptop you are having but you have to use it consciously because i am still saying sir with my confidence i am having my son and daughter who are studying with the laptop as ma'am said but with the internet on with one window your your lecture is going on in another window with in more than 50% of the cases there are other sites which are running parallelly you can't control them so this is what we as a teacher as a administrator as a parent has to think that online is good but at the age where the student has gone for online when they don't realize the plus and minus of using internet or using the social media for their development because our mind get deviated for the wrong thing very quickly than for the right thing so he keeps on uh, and also the teacher teacher has to now train himself in a better way like when you are teaching in a class you are just facing the 60 people and uh, you are just you have prepared your notes but now that student who is at home he has the access to internet whenever any teacher writes an equation write an answer the same time he google it out whether the teacher is writing a correct answer so a teacher has to study has to put his efforts more than what he was doing it when he was interacting face to face with the student so the challenge is there with the teacher challenge is there with the student challenge is there with the administrator as well as we as a parent also that how to now make a balance between all these things so i feel uh, the soft skill as well as critical thinking as well as at the same time the teacher training also is very very important in this type of situation and then and then only we can succeed in our as sir rightly said that this is the way of reaching to the extreme the one who can't afford to get education in some of the leading institution he can get trained by the courses which dr sina is uh, 
delivering or uh, his team is delivering so it is lucky for us lucky for a common man also but at the same time to make a balance is uh, uh, very very important otherwise this will lead into uh, maybe not a disaster but later on like the one who is there in the class 1 class 2 class 3 for 5 hours he is sitting on the uh, desktop his eyes his his um, the activity he is not going in between the class also because teacher is very strict if he is going out of the screen he she is asking he is asking where you are or that type of situation is there and this problem we have to think in a in a in a great way sir so sure. uh dr vaidhar uh, thanks for highlighting the various uh, dangers of getting into only online situation uh, i think uh, all the uh, panelists are uh, saying that only on line is not the solution the solution is a blended learning perhaps uh, so that there is a balance of the physical classes and online classes so the uh, point is uh, very well taken thanks for highlighting that so let me reach out to dr indu rao and uh, talk to her uh, regarding your views on uh, how do you look at the soft skills and the critical thinking and other skills which are not normally are part of the uh, typical university course structure and how do you uh, look at uh, courses like uh, what are the is uh, uh, doing dr indu rao <laughs> thank you dr ravi and uh, thank you dr pramath raj for uh, sharing with us what harappa is all about when i was coming to the panel i was also curious to know what uh, type of courses you are going to offer i fully uh, agree with all the panelists on the point that communication skills collaboration skills critical thinking skills are important we are also not very much aware of what uh, what is soft skill and how they should be implemented but let me share with you and this is my personal opinion as an academician who has always worked on culture and values that along with skills it is very important that we imbibe the right values to our students and our teachers without having the right values none of the skills are important i'll give you an example you give you have very communic very good communication skills which is what we just discussed very good communication skills and you use your communication skills only to manipulate and only to uh, so, uh, to suit your personal pro personal needs or personal professional needs and not the institution or the societal needs or the overall purpose of the education is not met then that communication skill is of no importance i have seen and because i have had experience in different schools i have seen people who are somewhere sometimes they have good uh, less uh, communication skills but they are so good at their work they are making a real contribution to the world and to the society like i have another example you have very good journalism skills but if you use your good journalism skills for fake news and trp like dr sharan prees uh, singh also pointed out those skills are of no use ultimately the end goal what it serves the purpose that it serves is important i i at vit because i am only one year at vit and what i have found i have never found these kind of values in that small place of velour a small town the kind of honesty truthfulness simplicity sincerity dedication integrity the kind of values and the kind of culture that is generated i think that is the reason and all these skills i beg to differ with dr pramath raj that our universities are not uh, taking care on the or one course they are doing actually there are these uh, all of these developing all these skills are integrated in almost all the processes that a student goes through in a institution there is no 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 it's not for no reason that uh, you know you have 4000 seats and you have 2 lakh applic applicants the number of applicants that were going for iit or something they are coming to vit and there is a long list and we have the best of the best students that we attract and there is a long waiting queue i mean even now in this pandemic times so the skills are important i think many of the and not just i have seen other universities many universities have incorporated i have paid attention have realized the importance of developing these skills your programs would be definitely an added value we would we would like to look at that look at it what you are going to offer and uh, because we are always open to the i mean vit is known for innovation it has also the best recognition of the best innovative university uh, the subtle innovation award and all of those things are there our students but more important than skills more important than skills i would say are the values if we are able to imbibe the uh, and give the and those values have to start from the leadership from the teachers from the staff and there are, there has to be a culture which supports which um, supports and promotes that kind of values if you have the right values of teaching so you have a very good teaching skill 
But uh, if you are not uh, transparent and honest about the content and the purpose of what you're going to teach in the class, then even that teaching skill is of no use. So you have to first understand what you want to do, why you want to do it, where, what it will lead to, what is the whole impact. Being a part of an educational institution is not just business or a job or a profession. It is the highest level of, it is the opportunity that God gives you. If you look at the, our earlier the, the distribution of work in our society, in our ancient times, we had the one section which was protecting us. So you see, and what are the skills for the future skills that you require? You need protection. You need, like you had the Kshatriyas they used to call, you need some, some skills so that some people can protect our society. You need some people who can take care of the knowledge base. So that, in, in the, if you uh, remember, the, in our ancient mythological traditions, the people who are taking care of knowledge and sharing of knowledge and learning were kept at the highest level. But we have to make ourselves suitable for uh, to deserve that highest level of place in the society. So the values of the teachers have to be impeccable. Unless we change that, the leaders have to have, hold a very, very high uh, value system. The teachers have to hold very, very high value system. Teachers should not be joining a profession of teaching just because they want to serve the uh, food and uh, their, uh, to serve, feed their, society, their family or because they're living in a certain place. Many of the people I have seen, many of the teachers who continue to stay in one university because they don't want to speak against what is going wrong. They don't want to speak they do because they say, oh, I don't want to change my place or you know, I just want to take home the salary at the end of the month. Such people should not be there into the system. Education system, only those people should be there who deliver what they are meant to deliver to serve the purpose of the education. So the skills are important more than the skills. It is the value system that we have to invite, which is important. And those uh, a culture has to be created in the different educational institutions to promote this. I, I have seen this in VIT. There is a culture which has promoted, and uh, I have never seen such an honest and uh, place with so much of integrity across the different stakeholders of the university. Excellent uh, points, Dr. Hindu. Uh, thanks for highlighting the importance of values and culture. I think that's the, the uh, basis or uh, foundation on which any organization is uh, developed. And uh, it's great to know that uh, VIT has been uh, having a high uh, degree of value in culture and ecosystem. So thanks for highlighting that. So uh, let me uh, uh, inform the panelists that there are some of the questions which uh, people have asked in the Q&A. Uh, button A, like you can all see. And uh, uh, some of the uh, people have highlighted the uh, importance of uh, MOOCs. And uh, uh, so let me ask uh, Pramat uh, that uh, there are enough uh, MOOC courses or uh, like uh, over there on the internet. And uh, I, I think as you mentioned some of it uh, anyway in your uh, last in intervention. So how do you see the content being offered by Harappa being different from the a uh, lot other uh, 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 courses online, which is anyway available from say Coursera or edX or uh, many more uh, platforms. So if you can highlight uh, that part. Yeah, uh, Ravi, I uh, obviously don't want to make this only about Harappa, but uh, I think if you look at, uh, I think CP already uh, address that, that a lot of what I'm teaching is not new. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Rao mentioned, and by the way, I had no intention of saying that VIT is not doing this. I'm sure you are, a VIT is an institution of eminence and I just have the highest regard for it. So I'm sure that VIT and many other institutions are teaching it. Uh, obviously there are many others who are not. And I think that's the part I'm trying to address. Uh, but going back to your question, uh, I think if you look at MOOCs in general, Ravi, uh, there are lots of courses out there and there's courses on everything. But let me give you an example. Suppose I'm studying thermodynamics. You know, CP will tell you, we both went to IIT Kanpur, you went to IIT Kanpur. We used to, you know, we used to sweat when we used to think about studying thermodynamics or fluid mechanics and heat and mass transfer, right? Now, the truth is these are difficult subjects, uh, studying about partial differential equations, right? Now, there are probably courses on partial differential equations or thermodynamics or fluid mechanics on Coursera or edX or MIT OpenX, or maybe there are courses on Swayam. Uh, there may be courses offered by Jitkara and uh, VIT. How, do, how does a student, if I'm studying at 
XYZ University in say Bihar, know which of these are most suitable for them. Right? I do think that that is the problem with MOOCs is that what has happened is there's just too many of these courses around and you don't know. And, and to the point that was made by many of the panelists today, that if the best faculties thermodynamics course, which is most understandable or simple to absorb is available, then I would like to take that one. No, I would not like to have to. So I think curating the content with a view to saying, if I had to teach only thermodynamics course, which would be that course? And is it even applicable to our student in India or is it too high falluting that the student may not get it because it's a very advanced course or is it right? So I think that is the challenge of MOOCs today. A lot of people have just created courses because they taught that course in their institution and they've gone and created that course. Uh, and so how do I adapt that course? A, a student typically in an engineering discipline or in a BA discipline typically does about 30 courses or 40 courses during the course. So which are those best 30, 40 courses that I need to take if I was not getting that from wherever I'm studying? That's really the philosophy with which Harappa is also trying to do things that yes, others will create lots of courses on communication, collaboration, teamwork, critical thinking. But how can I bring the best of that thinking to bear on somebody who wants to take it in a, if that is what people want. What is the best that I can offer them? If that is what people want. And therefore, I'm not going off and offering other courses. I'm only saying, is for these, I would like to be the best. I would like to make sure that these are available. So for example, now I'm taking my courses and putting them in Hindi uh, because I feel that the vernacular market is there. Uh, and and uh, why should I restrict myself to only English speaking people? It is now on the government portal. The government has a portal to train its own uh, people. Uh, we, we made it available there also. So the idea is to really own that niche and make sure. And I think that is going to happen as you will see over time uh, in, in a lot of these fields. So for MBA is such a common program. All our universities offer MBA programs, right? But you know, the best entrepreneurship course that I have seen is a course offered by Professor Tarun Khanna at Harvard and Harvard Business School, which is, by the way, available as a free course on edX. If you don't want to get the certification, you can do his entire course taught by the best faculty at Harvard Business School with amazing case studies. The interesting thing is that it's actually a case study with a lot of Indian companies in it. Now, most MBA program students don't know about this or faculty don't know about this. I would love for every Indian MBA student to do that course, not because it is taught by an Indian, but actually if you go through that course, it's very well put together and it highlights a lot of Indian companies uh, and the content is all very Indian. So I think that is the role that I would like us to play uh, at Harappa and other institutions who are going to set up online to say, other best available hai thermodynamics ka to main kyun ek aur thermodynamics ka course banau right let's me just offer that course to my students and maybe do something else which i can be best at that's really the way i am looking at it fantastic i think uh, uh, your uh, vision of uh, making those uh, best courses and uh, taking some niche areas which are not uh, available uh, uh, so uh, filling that uh, gap is uh, very, very important. Uh, so let me ask uh, uh, CP that uh, the, uh, what has been your experience about these uh, courses and uh, how do you see that uh, uh, students have uh, uh, like, uh, been able to benefit or the faculty has been able to benefit and uh, what's their ro uh, role going to emerge in the future? <clears throat> So I'll divide this in two parts. Uh, uh, when uh, over the period of the eight, nine years that we've been teaching data science and now we started with cybersecurity and now data engineering, MOOC has, you know, worked very well for us as a pipeline of getting students. So almost 70 to 80% of the students who come to us have already done something on, on MOOC. That's how they get introduced to which is still, I think, uh, an emerging thing, you know, uh, thing like data science. People say that data science is now old. I said, you know, compare it to physics and you'll realize it's still new, right? Okay. 
so uh, you know when we you know so so it's it's still a nascent thing for us and so mook mook i think is a great uh, when somebody is looking for a career somebody is looking for what do i want to study i think mook plays a great role you go and you know you experiment you toodle around you download one course everybody is talking about analytics what is analytics sometimes when, so we interview people uh, you know for for the data science program sometimes i tell them that i don't think don't chase a job you have to chase a career that you would like to do right so everybody is saying there are jobs maybe you want to do a couple of online go and look at that if you still think you want to do this every day of your life come back to us we'll interview you again so we used that as a testing ground both for the students themselves on their own and sometimes sending students there to say that you know because we don't want to most of our students they are working they leave their jobs and come so we don't want to be participants in bad decisions for them because you know they're disrupting their lives literally and of course the whole definition of disruption has changed after the pandemic nothing else seems to be disruption disruption anymore but it is a so so mook plays that role it it gives you a uh, you know an 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 entry into and on the other side we have used mooks a lot of once we switched online so we got coursera and we partnered with them and we got others and and we made that available to students as a value add because we were realizing that uh you know a lot of complex topics were taking longer to understand and so what we use data cam where which has assignments uh so so you know for us for the faculty to create so many assignments of, of quality is sometimes not easy students had more time at home as uh, dr rao rao had already said you know that they were, they were they were still at home so they could do a little more uh so so we used mooc again as a very good supplement to what was what we were teaching in our live uh you know uh, online classes so i think moving forward again you know i'll tell you what you know if you have a very passionate and very capable person with a lot of self discipline you know you don't need colleges today there is enough on on the net for a person to learn whatever he or she wants to but if we go back to our own student lives even in a place like iit kanpur since three of us were there it was not easy to get us into class and attend lectures and concentrate oh, yeah. correct uh, and and now, so so you know you can't run your is there will be some exceptional people who will be able to do everything on their own we, and we have people like that who who tell us that i you know i have, i i can learn I, i i can do it on my own but most people are not built that way right we are social creatures and we have distractions so i think that so i i look at mooc uh, becoming better and i think a lot of foreign universities will flood our markets more with such courses because A lot of people may not want to travel as much as they used they wanted to, so there, there's going to be a churn in that as well. How do how does the Indian student still become very very relevant for foreign universities? You know, how do I I get that student right? So I I think that MOOC is going to be there, and I think it is up to us to use it profitability for our students, profitably for our students. Uh, right. That's right. Fantastic. Uh, let me uh, address another question. That uh, there's a question asked here on the Q and A button. That how can faculty uh, members be prepared for the next gen classes? And uh, Dr. Parender, I think uh, you uh, mentioned in your last uh, interview, I mentioned that uh, when teacher is teaching something, and there's a student is like googling the same thing or, and uh, finding out uh, what's the Uh, latest thing so you talked about that uh, faculty has to be really uh, up to a date so uh, how do you uh, look at the current uh, faculty development uh, scenario in this uh, country and uh, what are the interventions which it or online uh, uh, learning can play there yes <clears throat> Sir, this is a very very important. You can say the talk of the town, uh, as Dr. Rao also suggested that only good faculty should be there in the teaching institution. Yes, yes. But let me tell you, ma'am, around ten percent of the topper, not ten, or maybe around two or three percent of the IIT, the good people from VIT, from other good institution, they join into teaching. teaching faculty are those who are not getting good job in in the good companies or 
those who are there yes there will be around 1% of the people who are there in this profession because of their passion but only 1% for remaining 95 or 99% you have to make them adaptable to this type of situation by training them as we all know we have to run the show we have to start maybe realizing them now they have joined this holiest profession which i am saying this profession is even better than than a doctor because when you are treating a patient you are treating only one patient when you are delivering a class you are spreading the education to whole 60 people at one time so whenever you have entered into this profession you have to start working on their um, maybe strengths and weaknesses i have to train them i have to tell them yes this is something which you have to now start loving it to it because otherwise there is the teacher nowadays or the student nowadays has i mean knowing the things even better than the teacher now if he is not getting himself ready for the uh, for the next generation student uh, he cannot deliver to the class for full 60 minutes or 70 or, or 55 minutes of the class so teacher has to be trained and it has to be trained by the courses like as sir said moocs there are so many good number of moocs courses available uh, and what we people are doing sir whenever we are asking the student to enroll for moocs we are asking the teacher also to enroll in the same course and how to select the good course like suppose uh, sir uh, in this uh, semester just uh, started from 15th of july we have to offer some courses in the moocs platform uh, from different other teachers in the month of april may we constituted a committee to look for the good courses on that subject because teacher who is teaching this course for say more than 5 10 years he may be knowing which content is good which content is better so he selected out of say 5 or 10 courses available then we offer it to the student so this is how you can say which is the good one because you have to uh, keep some uh, maybe uh, you have to uh, differentiate between as well that there are so many good number of teachers as he has given the example of uh, dr tarun karna there are so many good iit professors also whose course content is so good but when it when it comes to the communication part or when it comes to the the the, the, the presence of the this slide part they may not be very good so now it student requirement is it, the aesthetic also should be good one communication should also be good one and content wise it should, should also be good one so in order to help the student we as a university we can set up a committee of the senior teacher who can uh, just go through all the content go through all the lectures available and then decide and then we can offer it to the student so when the teacher is getting trained in that moocs course itself uh, this is one of the way of uh, grooming himself also and at the same time we also be do so many uh, uh, you can say career uh, the, the courses for teacher where uh, they have to before going to class they have to go for that induction program where we can train them for these type of the changes which are there because from classroom you have to shift now to the the online as well as uh, on the internet sure uh great inputs dr narendra and thanks for uh, highlighting the important uh, role these faculty plays in a uh, life of a student uh let me reach out to dr indu rao and there is a, uh, some questions on the q and a button where uh, uh someone has asked that how colleges can help students to inculcate 21st century skills and what major changes need to be done and uh, in these uh, pandemic situations the skill uh, requirements have suddenly got uh, uh, evolved in a way so how do you uh, look at uh, uh, this issue and also uh, there's a related question about uh, how uh, can institutions bridge the gap between academia and the industry so if you can uh, talk about these two topics induji Please unmute yourself, Dr. Indu, and uh, we are almost at the end of the uh, session. So, 
how, yeah. how much time we have? Uh, around uh, five minutes, five, six minutes. So, uh, it's, it's a very good and relevant question. The purpose of institutions is to bridge the gap between practice and, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, and what is there in the theory. So our institutions, the way they can help students is, one is for, as Charanpreet uh, Ji was talking, that uh, the students, there is a lot of information available on the web course, or even for VIT, they offered so many courses. During the pandemic, I think they went and offered free courses to all, almost all the major institutions. But the student is always uh, concerned which course to choose which was also shared by Dr. Pramathraj. So the universities will play, the major, major, major uh, role that universities will play with is that they will guide the student through their faculty and through their curriculum committee and course design and program design that what courses are important, what are the future uh, uh, placement opportunities, what are the different avenues where the student can contribute in the industry or practice or any other field after he or she passes out of the institution and in order to and to help them select what they like what they would like to do after they pass out of the institution and when they enter the institution that is the time they should be helping the students to uh, helping them to choose and accordingly they should be able to choose the right course or right program because what is available nowadays on the platter is so huge that it's very hard for the students to choose that is one very important role that universities will play for bridging the gap uh, this in uh, industry academia gap uh, most uh, like what vit does is we have partnership with, and uh, we have partnership with many industries we have several schools we have equal number of research centers at our place we have equal we have a large number of tie up with the different industries around uh, the around uh, Velour in uh, the Tamil Nadu across the country and we have uh, collaborations across the world. More than 300 universities, top universities, we have M MOUs. We are focusing on multidisciplinary, international, industry-based teaching, research, almost all the aspects. Only through addressing all of these needs can you bridge this gap. And research has to be, I, I, there is one important point, since time is less, I will share. Research has to lead to something that will, we are too far obsessed with the A journals. We, we men, I don't know in the pandemic how many A journals have actually helped the society or helped solve this the problem of humanity. We have to do research so that we address the real life problems of the society and the world and what we deliver should be able to, uh, it, it should be actionable. We should be put, translate that into some action and help the society. Those are the important things that university have to play. University has a, another very important role that you hire the best talent. We have, we say there are few good teachers, but because of our recruitment system has not been good, our promotion system has not been good, we have not recognized the best talent in our country. It is not that we don't have good talent in our country. The university's role is to find out who are the best faculty, the best talents in different fields, different disciplines, get them into the university system and make them accessible to all the the students of the country of the university and through digital platform this huge transformation has come i am sure the good universities who are already well established we even if you hear the uh, prime ministers uh, and the new new education policy we want to increase the gross enrol enrollment ratio so universities can actually help in uh, uh, making and giving access of their own good faculty, their own good research facilities, their own uh, collaborations uh, and uh, different uh, resources that they have to the masses, which are not so privileged to uh, reach until the universities. Sure. Uh, great uh, points, Dr. Indu. Uh, thanks for highlighting the various aspects uh, of uh, uh, industry and academy collaborations and how we uh, look at uh, students at uh, the skilling and upskilling themselves. So uh, we are almost at the end of the session and uh, I want to uh, just uh, reach out to Dr. Uh, Thomas Sinha. Uh, there's a question uh, which has been asked uh, by Professor R.C. Bhattacharya. And he has uh, uh, mentioned that uh, while we have to give stress on technology, do not you think we should also equip our faculty with finer aspect of humanities so that the students become a holistic person including emotional and ethical aspects. And it's like relates to the uh, value, values uh, 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 point which Dr. Indu had highlighted in uh, her last uh, uh, intervention. So, uh, if you can uh, talk about that, uh, Dr. Pramad, that how uh, uh, how do you orient faculty who are teaching, even say uh, thermodynamics or fluid mechanics, with the humanities angle? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ravi, if I may. Uh, 
this is a tough one uh, you, know, <laughs> you, you you know in when i was a, i was a young boy in school we used to have moral science classes and uh, you know it didn't stop us from uh, doing things that you know we were told not to do uh, this is always a tough one but i think the the in school the biggest impact was i'll give you a quick story many years later i met my school uh, teacher once uh, mrs gauri ishwaran she's actually very well known you may know her she set yes, up yes. some school she was my english teacher when i was in grade 9 so one day i asked her that you know what was very special about the school because i have found that the graduates of this school have gone on to do many things that are quite admirable one school in patna a small town what happened she said you know the principal used to be a very special guy and what he used to always tell us is that you don't have to worry about anything the only one thing you have to worry about is you make your students happy now if you think about this obviously the principal was not trying to say that you make students happy and give them you know let them have fun and and you know let them have pleasure happiness right he is talking about the happiness of learning the happiness of uh, uh you know growing the happiness of engagement the happiness of uh, growth and 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 uh, excitement and anticipation of learning something new i think that's a very telling remark my belief is that institutions that impart the kind of values or the holistic education that uh, dr rao is talking about and and the gentleman who asked the question is talking about has to come from the top and by the way this happens in companies also uh, ravi i mean you are running a company for many years i have watched you it's the it's what the management and the ceo and the leader and the founder want the company to do right people people inherently want to do good things right teachers also want after all you are getting into the teaching profession you yeah, are to earn a living but you are committed there are many other professions that pay much more you can do much more people are committing because they are interested in knowledge in in sharing in teaching young people so everybody has an intrinsic value to give back with to the purpose of education to the purpose of knowledge creation research holistic learning values i think that the the people at the top have to first and foremost walk the talk you know in the q and a i also saw saw that a lot of people are frustrated about selection process and you know promotions you know these are same thing happens in companies you say that i'm going to be meritocratic but you promote the people who are not how will you ever have values in a company like that or a university like that so i think a lot of it is really about the values of and that's why i say that for universities and schools governance is the big factor what you are teaching whether you are teaching mba or btech or ai or data science or biotech or soft skills or hard skills wo sab apni jagah pe but the real issue is how is the place governed is the people at the top and the vice chancellor the people on this call are we all committed to holistic and values based education if you are then you will attract that kind of teacher that will they will impart that kind of education and that is the it's a simple answer it's not easy to do and i recognize that but that is the key way to make this happen all of this we know it's not that we don't know all this we can always go back to takshashila and nalanda and say that values based education has been in our blood in our genes in fact we, if we don't know values based education who knows uh but i think you have to have the management and the governance and the board and the trustees and the founders and the vice chancellors who embody that and demand that of their faculty and they will then make sure that students get that that's all i have to say thank you very much for inviting me sure so i am uh, going to take uh, one more last question i like if someone has uh, said that i really like to listen dr kamak sir and same here so i am uh, going to extend it for 2 minutes or 3 minutes more and ask you a last question of this panel and then we end it here dr uh, pramod uh, you have been as you mentioned that uh, you have been in the education sector for last 25 years and especially in the higher education sector and everyone is like saying that covid is the turning point for higher education sector in many ways in india and also abroad so uh, asking you to give us uh, your views on how are the next 5 years for overall higher education sector in india or abroad and how do you see that it is going to change or evolve 
if you can. No, I'm uh, Ravi, not to take too much time and too much. Uh, you are giving me unfair time over my panelists, so I feel awkward. But I will say that I'm very excited. Uh, I'm very excited because you know big changes happen when lots of things come together. So what has come together? One is there is massive, continues to be massive demand for education in this country and quality education. People are sick and tired of having to go to the same institutions and not feeling happy, to my point about happy. Most students, most parents are actually not happy. So people are demanding quality education. That's one good thing that is happening. People are not just happy with a degree. There was a time when, chalo, kahi bhi ja ke ek degree le lo. Now people are saying, no, I quality education, I want career, I want, I demand that. It is my right. So I think that's very strong. The second is that the government is waking up and saying, listen, we have to do something different. If you look at the new education policy, and I, I'm, I'm a practical man, the last policy never got implemented. Uh, and this policy uh, has uh, is a really a catch up. A lot of what is in the policy is happening around the world. Some of us are doing it at our universities already. But at least they are speaking the same language. Same language. They are talking about holistic, multidisciplinary, you know, and so on. So I think that's a very big step. And they are putting a lot of emphasis on technology. Uh, in two, three weeks, you will see I'm involved in launching a technology platform, uh, which is on behalf of the government. I have never seen that kind of support where people are saying, Aap isko karo, launch karo. we want to use. So I think second, that is the government support on the right things. You know, now the disconnect between what you and I are saying and what they are saying has become much more. Uh, will it get implemented? We'll see. But at least hum ek ko convince karne ki koshish nahi kar rahe. we are aligned. Right. Uh, and the third thing is the, uh, is the, uh, is the acceptance, at least not, not full, but to a large extent, acceptance of technology as a pedagogical medium that is adding to whatever we have in terms of infrastructure in the country. I think these three trends uh, are very, very, uh, and of course, the private sector is also creating a lot of excitement. Uh, and I'm not saying that they are really going to solve the core, but the the growth of people like Baiju's and Unacademy and Vedantu is also creating an excitement about the structure. Maybe you will say that for the formal education, it's not such a great thing because it's all about coaching and test prep and so on. But nevertheless, there is a general awareness that education is important and, and that technology can play a big role in education. So I'm actually very excited. I genuinely believe that this is a sector in which the true innovation is going to come out of this country. And the reason I say that, I'm not saying it because of jingoism or nationalism, because true innovation happens then when there is a scarcity, when there is a constraint, when there is a challenge that never have in the history of the human race have we had to educate so many, many, many people so quickly. Old models say, yes, problem solve nahi ho sakta, ho hi nahi sakta. So innovation karna hi padega, there is no choice. And that is the time when true innovation really happens. So I'm actually hoping that one of us or some of us will come, come together and make something exciting happen out of India. And I'm very confident of that. Fantastic. I think uh, great uh, concluding remarks and great uh, panel overall. Uh, honored to have you uh, with us, Dr. Indu Rao. Uh, CP Singh. I have just uh, just one one line in okay. what sure. uh, yes yeah I fully agree with you sir so many things are coming together the government also supporting they have at least they want to do something education is coming together the young generation wanting to really learn and not just degree I think online uh, Dr Ravi the topic that you started what online is doing we have heard of that Samudra Manthan. So this online is actually doing that churning of Samudra Manthan where sahi ka sahi, galat ka galat sab ho jayega. And I think we are in a very, very uh, uh, fantastic point in the history in uh, education. We, if, if we if we make use of this opportunity, we can really get back the glory of uh, our uh, education that India had uh, many, many thousands years ago. Fantastic. So uh, let me uh, thank uh, uh, amazing speakers we had and amazing perspectives from all uh, parts of the country. Uh, I think uh, Hindu Rahoji from the south and uh, Chitkara University from the north and we have uh, CPC from the east of India 
and uh, Pramath, like you have been all over the place, so uh, but you. <laughs> So, uh, thanks for uh, great uh, discussions and great insights. And really, uh, I am feeling more inspired and more energetic after uh, listening to all of you. And I think, I hope all the delegates have been uh, also like enjoyed this uh, session uh, too well. And uh, requesting all the delegates, if you have liked this session, uh, please uh, share it on the Facebook, on your like, social uh, platforms. Uh, uh, let the uh, knowledge reach to a lot more people. Uh, thank you so much, each of you. Thank you so much.